Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Good uh, day, good night, depends where you are. And welcome to our um, anniversary. Today with you, we are going to celebrate our 10th anniversary of MARTS. MARTS means Management of Aortic Rupture, Zurich. We started all in 2010, and now in this COVID time, we are obliged to do, make it um, online. So welcome once again. Um, management of aortic rupture means there are so many parts and we divided, as you know, for all of you who were from the beginning with us in four parts. The first was imaging and diagnosis. The second was open surgery and third day was yesterday endovascular surgery. And today we're going to focus on the uh, perioperative management of aortic uh, rupture. So I will uh, give the word to my, uh, our co-director of the Marx course, Benedict Reutersberg. So Benedict, would you be pleased to make wrap up what we heard yesterday? So please, Benedict. Yeah, warm welcome also from my side to the last day of our anniversary, Marx. Uh, we have already had uh, three successful days. Last week, we started with imaging and diagnostics um, of ruptured triple A's followed by the second day where we discussed open surgical treat treatment in depth and uh, yesterday followed by endovascular therapy. Uh, there were exciting presentations on factors that influence uh, the endovascular management from local anesthesia uh, to permissive um, hypertension and the right equipment, what we have to use from Christos Karkos uh, gave us here a very good overview. My former colleague from Munich, Albert Busch, gave a lecture on vascular access in uh, ruptures and uh, it was particularly uh, exciting to hear what tips and tricks uh, there are in the event of problems uh, in this access, um, um, gaining access. Uh, Konstantin Donas, um, as an expert for parallel grafts, uh, was able to report on the advantages and limitations of these techniques. Uh, a very exciting topic uh, followed uh, from Nicolas Zilimparis uh, from Munich as well, who uh, explained the wide range and possibilities of uh, physician modified stand graft. Um, our course director, Alexander Zimmern, showed us very impressively uh, the lessons he has learned in the treatment of uh, aortic ruptures. In particular, he emphasized that a well coordinated. Um, and trained team is needed for the treatment of triple um, ruptured triple A's, that blood pool management is important and that uh, centralization in high volume centers is needed. Uh, more about this today from my former colleague, Matthias Trenner. Yesterday um, was rounded up by Alexander Oberhuber who took us on the journey uh, in time in the development of the uh, off the shelf device um, Endside. Uh, which was also quite interesting how this developed. And um, today we are looking forward uh, to exciting talks on perioperative management. And I like to emphasize that uh, the chat function can be used um, actively and the panel is happy to answer these questions. So thank uh, Benedict for the great overview from the day where for each session we have the chairman. So today, we have two chairmen, one from uh, the north, one from the south. From the north is coming Colin Bicknell, reader from Imperial College and the consultant vascular surgery from uh, St. Mary's Hospital. So welcome to Colin. The second one is uh, Rui Fernandes and Fernandes. He is coming from the south, from Portugal, from St. Maria hospital in Lisbon and the faculty of medicine in Lisbon. So these two guys are going to be our chairman and these two guys are responsible to answer on your questions. So please, uh, we are all happy to answer you. Use your time because this is your course and ask us a hard question. Ask us a challenging question because we are happy to answer. So let's start with the talks. The first is going to be given by Thomas Stadlbauer. He's a cardiologist, angiologist, internal medicine specialist, one who worked with the Voyager PAD trial, and he's working now with us in uh, Zurich. So he's going to talk about what to do in patients with anticoagulation and antiplatelet therapy. So all the lectures are pre-recorded. So please, Thomas, we start your presentation. 
I would like to thank the organizers for the privilege to the 10th anniversary of the march. These are my disclosures. Aortic rupture is a true medical and surgical emergency. The blood on floor sign in the operation theater often correlates with poor prognosis. However, the majority of our patients with aortic rupture suffer from severe cardiovascular disease and therefore are under antithrombotic therapy. The challenge in patients with antithrombotic therapy is that they have an increased risk of perioperative bleeding, death and cardiovascular adverse events. What are indications for antiplatelet therapy? Basically, atherosclerosis is the main indication for antiplatelet therapy. These patients suffer from chronic coronary syndrome or peripheral arterial disease and are basically treated with a monotherapy with aspirin or clopidogrel. If the atherosclerosis is activated, for example, after intervention, then dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and P2Y12 receptor antagonists like clopidogrel, prazogrel, or tigracrelor are on board. Indications for anticoagulation are normally atrial fibrillation or venous thromboembolism. This can be done by vitamin K antagonists like fenpocomone or warfarin, or by the so-called non-vitamin K depending oral anticoagulations. Dabigatran is a factor 2A inhibitor, apixaban or rivaroxaban are factor 10A inhibitors. Only in a small cohort of patients, dual or triple anticoagulation and antiplatelet therapy is performed. How should we now manage patients with pre-existing antithrombotic therapy? The first and most important thing is that time is the best antidote for antithrombotic therapy. Therefore, postponing of operations or interventions, if possible, is to consider. The European Society of Cardiology recommends the perioperative use of aspirin as a level B class two recommendation. How to proceed with patients on dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and P2Y12 receptor inhibitors like clopidogrel, prazogrel, or tigracrelor. Clopidogrel is the prototype of the P2Y12 receptor inhibitors. It's an irreversible inhibitor of thrombocyte function. As a prodrug, clopidogrel has to be activated in a two-step approach. His antithrombotic function lasts for at least three to four days due to the fact that 15% of the thrombocyte pool is rebuilt every day. The half-life of clopidogrel is approximately seven hours. No active metabolite lights are produced. Based on these pharmacological assumptions, Greinacher et al. from Greifswald have developed a concept of platelet transfusion for reversal of dual antiplatelet therapy in patients requiring urgent surgery. This has been published as a cohort study. However, aspirin and clopidogrel given, is given the day before surgery. Directly before surgery, two platelet concentrates are transfused. 6 to 48 hours after surgery, aspirin and clopidogrel administration is restarted. Greinacher and colleagues have reported the safety outcome of 181 consecuted patients who received this protocol. Does this protocol work with prazogrel or tigracrelor? Unfortunately, it doesn't work because prazogrel has active metabolites and tigracrelor is a reversible inhibitor of thrombocyte function. We can conclude on the use of P2Y12 receptor inhibitors, preoperative platelet transfusion can reverse effect of clopidogrel. No reversal of the effect of prazogrel or tigracrelor is currently available. In 
terms of an outlook. Ticrotrilor reversal agent is under investigation. This is a monoclonal antibody fragment. A phase one study is published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So how should we now manage patients with pre-existing anticoagulation? If they are treated by vitamin K antagonist, fenprocomone or warfarin, the effects of these drugs last for four to seven days. If surgery can be postponed for 12 to 24 hours, IV vitamin K can be applied. For urgent surgery, prothrombin complex concentrate 1500 to 3000 international units can be transfused as an alternative also fresh frozen plasma can be used how should we manage patients on noax like dabigatran apixaban or rivaroxaban these drugs are effective for 24 to 48 hours due to their half-life of eight hours emergency surgery can be performed after 12 to 24 hours as an alternative for immediate surgery surgery prothrombin complex concentrates ppsb can be transfused as an alternative for dabigatran there's an dabigatran antibody available this can be iv infused prior to surgery a recombinated factor 10a is available to reverse the effect of apixaban or rivaroxaban Therefore, we can summarize. Many patients are on antithrombotic therapy while suffering aortic rupture. Time is the best antidote for antithrombotic therapy. Unfortunately, treatment of aortic rupture can often not be delayed. Preoperatively, platelet transfusion can reverse clopidogrel effect. Prasocrel and ticrocrelor effects cannot be reversed. The effect of vitamin K antagonists can be abolished by vitamin K, PPSB, or fresh frozen plasma. Reversal agents for dabigatran and for apixaban and rivaroxaban are available. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. So, um, I don't know where he is. I've lost him. Uh, we've got no questions. If you have got a question, do put it onto the Q&A or pop it into the chat unless I'm missing them. Uh, and we can ask our excellent um, uh, panel, uh, panelists and speakers today. I, uh, I was very interested by what you said. It's a common question. How much do you think that uh, that uh, hematology should be involved in all of these cases? Uh, okay. Or and during the operation, I'm thinking about as well. Can they be helpful all the way through? Well, I think this is a very important question. The situation, I think, basically what we see is when we have this major aortic rupture. Hematology often can support a few laboratory values, but in the emergency situation, I don't, don't think that at the beginning, the management will be really uh, be improved when hematology is too much on board. You know, we have to have an emergency uh, management. Um, with regard to the perioperative management, I think investigations like Rotem and things like that can be very helpfully, but at the beginning of the surgery, often we really have to, to start uh, with the operation interim immediately. Mm. Uh, Paresh Pai asked any role for doing TEG, which uh, is, is important. Uh, how, how do you use TEG during ruptures to, to help out? Oh, I'm not familiar. What is TEG? I'm not familiar with this. Oh, from elastogram. Okay, uh, this is something that I specialized in internal medicine. I cannot really answer very good. Maybe Bernhardt, uh, that is one is our anesthesiologist, is able to do this. He's certainly very good. Uh, very strict institutional guidelines here in the University Hospital in Zurich from uh, my department. And uh, we use, uh, we start actually every of these cases with a Rotem. 
so that we know the values at the beginning. And uh, as soon as it starts or doesn't stop bleeding, we repeat those measurements. So we go from A to point B and C, and on the way, we uh, treat with uh, whatever is needed, coagulation factors, thrombocytes. Mm. Uh, I have some questions here from Zoran. Oh, Zoran, how are you? Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to ask it or shall I? Uh, I will ask him then. I just wanted sure to then. start the chat to promote it. In cases, the, Thomas, that we have the patient with on the oral anticoagulation and he has ENR, INR for 2.4 and we start the procedure, we puncture the artery and we see um, that it's not clotting. And in general, for endovascular procedure, we give uh, heparin. In this case, with the rupture, should we be happy with this not clotting and not give heparin or still we have to give heparin? Okay, this is a ve very interesting question. I think the major problem is that we have a clear la uh, lack of evidence uh, or guidance with regard to this. I remember there was a very good overview from Matt Thompson about 10 years ago where they have recommended uh, the use of heparin. The question that I always ask is what is the reason for an INR of 2.4? Basically, if the patient was on vitamin K antagonists, what I really would uh, recommend is to transfuse uh, thrombocyte concentrates, uh, not thrombocyte concentrates, uh, prothrombine uh, concentrates. And uh, I think this is the standard procedure that normally then is done. Okay, thanks. Um, we had uh, more questions. Maybe you're going to answer that in chat, Isabel ask you, but we will uh, move to the next talk. Uh, Colin Bicknell, he introduced the specific, he initiated the specific and unique team training at the uh, Cyclotron building in uh, Imperial. So we are going to hear the second talk, Colin Bicknell, education and team training. Please pre-record the slides. Many thanks for the invitation to, to speak at the 10th anniversary of the Mars course. I'm going to talk to you about education and team training in ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysms. These are my disclosures. This picture is from the 1994 German Grand Prix. This is Joss Verstappen's car. The high performing team involved here extinguish the fire in less than four seconds. And the question is, can we perform as well as this team uh, during a ruptured aneurysm case? There are a number of principles that are important in the training of high performing teams. Vascular surgery has high rates of errors. The pattern of errors is largely team based and it follows then that it's vital to reduce error to produce a high performing team. This is the LEAP study in aortic surgery patients. It's 185 aortic procedures in this study performed by 20 different teams. There was a widespread of errors in different categories, but notice how errors around equipment used, errors independent of the procedure and communication and team working feature strongly compared to technical errors where we post where we place most emphasis on our training. 6.5% of this cohort were judged as being harmed by error and half of these stemming from communication difficulties. Training should focus on every aspect of error. A useful concept is that of marginal gains popularized by the UK cycling team. The principle of this marginal gains comes from the idea that if you break everything down you can think of that goes into riding a bike and then improve it by 1%, you'll get a significant increase in performance when you put everything together. And you can see how this would be very important when talking about aortic surgery, especially in the ruptured aneurysm situation. When we're talking about improving every aspect of care, I think we need to be clear that we're improving the whole pathway of care. 
a good example of why this is important might be the Challenger shuttle crash disaster. Although the technical problem causing this crash was a malfunctioning of an o-ring as it became too cold actually in Diane Vaughan's book that looked at launch decisions and the culture of NASA and popularized the term normalization of deviance do we start to understand exactly why the launch was allowed to happen even with this potential for disaster in place as part of the LEAP study, we looked at 10 units and surveyed 30 to 50 people in vascular surgery in each of those units. The score for teamwork I've drawn out here. The scores are just about acceptable, but focus on the bottom right graph. The proportion of respondents with positive perceptions of teamwork is very low in some units. We haven't matched our desire to centralize our services and to improve our techniques with our desire to pay attention to team training and there's a lack of inclusive training in many of the units in the UK. Hmm? So how do we train effectively? Well, tell me and I forget teach me and I may remember, involve me and I learn. With a focus on emergency aortic surgery, where there is less and less opportunity to practice in modern day medicine, simulation is very important. To train as a team at Imperial, we use this immersive simulated angiography suite where we can monitor feedback and rehearse even patient specific cases. But equally training in situ in an empty theater, perhaps every time a case of, is canceled, is effective. For ruptured situations, the simulated immersive environment appears valid. Experts complete each step of a ruptured aneurysm case quicker, and the subjective views of experts clearly demonstrate the realistic nature of the simulator. In this highly controlled environment, you can show a definite advantage of training. This study involved 20 registrars from four regions in the UK, and after technical instruction, they perform a simulated thoracic rupture case, structure debriefing, focusing on technical and non-technical skills, and retesting show significant improvements in communication, coordination, cooperation, leadership, and team monitoring. More technically advanced is patient-specific simulated rehearsal. Taking CT scans from the patient in front of you, recreating a simulated case and practicing as a team can significantly reduce the number of errors made in the case performed subsequently. And practicing as a team seems to dramatically reduce the time taken for a patient to get from the door of the accident and emergency department into the operating theater with an occlusive balloon in place. So as a direct result of our research and, uh, and as a direct result of this research stream, we've instituted a weekly multidisciplinary team training schedule that involved all of our team members from the ward theaters involving surgeons, anesthesiologists, radiology and nursing staff. The program is structured, tackling routine and emergency scenarios and is able to react to serious incidents that occur at Imperial. We're able to try out safely, practice and introduce new pathways of care using this model. It's mentored by all of our consultant staff, occurring in our simulated angiography suite using the equipment and consumables we use in theatres every day and allows us to train with specific devices. Within Imperial, on a more general sense, we now have a team training program for all of the surgical teams involving NDT simulation, 
human factors learning and in situ coaching and learning. Our latest research in conjunction with the University of Leicester has shown the effect of team training on surgical teams. It shows that after team training, the number of errors is reduced, the delay of, in operations due to error is reduced, and the high peaks of this graph are reduced, demonstrating that there are no cases after training with huge numbers of error. In conclusion then, training teams will likely bring significant benefits if you focus on teams, their culture, the whole pathway using immersive training and perhaps in introducing case specific training and crisis training and using a focus on training after error. And I propose giving the evidence that there is now that proactive team training Thank you, Colin. That was awesome. I think that was the end of your <laughs> of your recording. Um, so we'll open up for Q and A. Thank you. Thanks very much. I think there was a, a two letters left. Um, it, it, can I start? There was a question on the uh, a question and answer session that says the citation in the talk was originally from Confucius and finished correctly. The last line is involved me and I will understand. I would say a few things to that. Uh, that's just as good as the quote that I put down. And secondly, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't uh, necessarily credit Confucius, but more Isabel van Herzl, who was uh, the one that taught me all about this when she was at Imperial doing all her her stuff. And of course. Um, was a great uh, friend of mine while she was here and, and uh, hopefully she can add to this discussion as well if there is time for it. So, hello, Colin. I think you have a, a question from Zoran. I don't know if you want to ask Zoran, but uh, should I read it? You ask, you ask, because I'm just trying to <laughs> promote in chat. So that's why I'm okay. asking always. So I just want to thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to be here. And the question for you, Colin, is from Zoran. If we make team training with the whole team, senior, implanter, assistant, technician, anesthesiology team, how to convince the senior ones to be part of training because they know everything? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, just as much in the UK as in as in uh, in the continent, I should imagine. The, um, uh, the the best way we found of involving the senior people was actually for the senior people to be trainers and mentors of their team. So we would simulate a ruptured thoracic uh, case or an infrarenal case, and have the each of the consultants in. And you need a very strong person like Celia Riga to boss them all around. But they all came in and their team would do the procedure. And then the, the, uh, the senior members of the team would feed back to their team. I think it um, firstly gives everyone a chance to work together. It gives everyone on the team a chance to, to uh, know exactly what everyone wants done. And then when that senior person is in theatre the next week, they can have no complaints that their team hasn't been trained properly because they were the ones that did it. And uh, another very interesting uh, question from Patrick Strong. Has your uh, team training made a difference in mortality outcomes from Rivar at St. Mary's? Yeah, definitely. No, I don't know the answer to that, Patrick, <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, that would be a, a study we would love to do. I mean, we've, we've just about got round to looking at uh, Andrew Studdo, who was at Leicester, looking at one team who started off in a, in a new environment, looking at their, their errors, the major and minor errors that were made, and then instituting a team training program with a washout, and then looking again in a pre-post sort of study. And the variability changes, and the absolute number seem to come down, and the amount of minutes wasted comes down, but does it make a clinical out a difference? I think you probably would need quite a few people to do that. Be interesting to do it in just ruptures, but we do, we we and all the other centres in the UK don't have huge huge numbers. 
And finally, one last question, I think from Paresh Pai. How does the team come together in an emergency after hours where they are not on call? I'm not sure if I understand this question. I, uh, I, I think what that question means is, yeah, it's all very well training a team and then you get in the middle of the night and you have a load of, you have everyone who's different. And I think this is the complaint that everyone in the world has is that it's always a different scrub nurse and, and uh, radiographer and and anaesthetist that are involved in there. Uh, and there is no answer to this, except to say that um, we tend to have a, a group of nurses who uh, like doing vascular and they're a pool of vascular people. And we would, if you, if you can keep on doing the training, you can take one or two of those nurses out for six week periods and keep training them and try and do as much as you can. Uh, and that's really as best as you can. And then COVID comes along and then it's really difficult for the, for the entire thing because you're not allowed to all get together. But we will solve that problem as we come to it. And we still have questions. Zoran, we have time? Can we... I think I will just ask for, we have two questions. We are going to answer Jason uh, into the chat for the question, but just ask, he mentioned that uh, Isabel is a very good friend of uh, him and he did not want to answer on her question. And the question is uh, how often we have to organize the team trainings to be available to do this. I suspect you could probably get um, 10 different answers if you ask five different people for that. The, um, uh, the, the model that we use was to make it a, a weekly thing so that it was weekly means was team training. Okay. It makes it a culture more than anything. Okay. Thank you very much, Colin. So we are going uh, with the next talk. It was great talk, Colin. Uh, anesthesia for rupture aortic aneurysm is going to be given by uh, Bernard Krüger. Here is anesthesiologist and ICU uh, doctor, and he's really involved in the treatment of um, an algorithm of making how to do from the anesthesiological point of view in patients with rupture. So let's see how we are doing that. Thank you, Bernard, to be with us. Dear MARTS participants and dear MARTS faculty, thank you for the invitation to present Anesthesia Management of Ruptured Aortic Aneurysms. My name is Bernhard Krüger. I am anesthetist and intensivist at the University Hospital in Zurich. For this talk, I have no conflicts of interest and nothing to disclose. Anesthesia is part of the multidisciplinary team taking care of the patient from entry to the hospital in the resuscitation room, through the procedure up to the ICU. For EVAR of a ruptured aneurysm, we use analgositation. This is less time consuming and lets you start the procedure earlier. The sympathetic tone of the patient is better preserved and this uh, gives more hemodynamic stability. The abdominal muscle tone is preserved and this may contain the bleeding. And last but not least, we have a perfect neuromonitoring of the patient. Using general anesthesia for endovascular repair or open repair, the patient has no pain, there's no anxiety or agitation, so there'll be no patient movement during the case, and no necessary, it is not necessary to converse from local anesthesia to general anesthesia amidst in the case. The problem with general anesthesia is that many patients do aspirate under uh, emergency conditions and there's massive hemodynamic instability because of hypovolemic shock and this leads to a higher fluid load, more coagulopathy and more abdominal compartment syndrome. The following standard lines and tubes are required for analgo sedation. This is standard monitoring, two large bovinous cannulas, one radial artery catheter, a Foley catheter and a nasogastric tube. Until the aortic rupture is sealed, we use the concept of permissive hypovolemia and hypertension. This means rigorous fluid restriction and a blood pressure goal of 70 to 90 millimeters mercury systole. In this phase, we try to sustain the perfusion of all the vital organs, that is the heart and the brain. So in a patient with a blood pressure above 90 millimeters of mercury, we start with analgo sedation. 
giving small doses of fentanyl and a continuous infusion of remifentanil and dexmedetomidin. This will take away the pain from the patients and will usually lower the blood pressure. If this is not enough, we give vasodilators, that would be urapidil or esmolol. If the blood pressure is below 90 millimeters of mercury systole in our patients and the patient is awake and cooperative, we use only analgo sedation and give no fluids or any vasoactives. If the patient is um, somnolent or uncooperative, we elevate the blood pressure to our target value, target zone 70 to 90 millimeters uh, mercury. First, we give a vasopressor, then we give a fluid bolus, and if that doesn't uh, bring the patient back, to a cooperative state, we have to uh, induct general anesthesia. Please remember to um, insert an intraortic balloon if necessary. After the aortic rupture is sealed, this ends the phase of permissive hypovolemia and hypotension. We correct anemia by giving uh, red blood cell concentrates. We correct hypovolemia primarily by the infusion of crystalloids. Coagulopathy is counteracted according to our institutional guidelines where we use lots of point of care testing, including Rotem and other laboratory tests by, um, in, by infusion of uh, coagulation factors, thrombocyte concentrates, fresh frozen plasma, especially if the factor five is below 20%. And we use tranexamic acid to counteract uh, hyperfibrinolysis. That the blood coagulates well, the conditions have to be good. So hypothermia must be corrected by warming all infusions and applying a warming blanket. And hypocalcemia and acidosis must be corrected by intravenous infusions of calcium and sodium bicarbonate. Here you can see the anesthesia management in a patient with an infrarenal aortic aneurysm rupture in July 2015. First of all, we stopped all fluids. Then to bring the blood pressure to our target zone of 70 to 90 millimeters of mercury, we gave uh, as analgosidation a little bit of fentanyl and then uh, a vasodilator, urapidil. This uh, was followed by a drop of the blood pressure towards uh, 60 to 70 millimeters of mercury systole. But uh, as the patient was uh, awake and uh, corporate during the case, we um, tolerated this. The patient uh, was then in the face of permissive hypovolemia and hypotension until the rupture was sealed. Then we started giving red blood cell concentrates to, uh, to correct uh, the blood volume organ perfusion, and we corrected coagulopathy. If abdominal compartment syndrome evolves during the case and decompressive laparotomy has to be performed, you should remember that hemodynamics during general anesthesia are most stable when an intraortic balloon has been inserted or if the rupture of the aorta has been sealed previously by EVA and we had time to intravascularly refill the patient. Concluding this lecture, I would like to highlight several key points. Firstly, analgosidation with local anesthesia is feasible and safe for endovascular aortic repair of aortic aneurysm rupture. We have been doing this for years. Before sealing of the rupture, apply the concept of permissive hypovolemia and hypertension but do not over resuscitate the patient after sealing of the rupture. And at any point during the procedure, check for abdominal compartment syndrome, which is the real killer in all of these patients. Thank you for your attention and interest in the anesthesia management of ruptured aortic aneurysms. Please feel free to ask questions. So thank you, Bernard. Um, I, I have a question. So we work uh, very often together and you, you, you said or you presented in your presentation in terms of, uh, I read it here because I made a picture in terms of coagulopathy, the target should be no diffuse bleeding. 
and uh, the actions are multiple testings. And what I experience sometimes is that um, me as surgeon, I say, well, I have a problem, I have diffuse bleeding. And the reaction of the anesthetist is that he still does his, uh, uh, does his testings and say, well, uh, the testings are okay, so there cannot be a problem. But when the, 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 the result or the aim of the testing should be that there is no diffuse bleeding and I have a diffuse bleeding, don't you think that there should be a reaction from the anesthetist? Or is it really worth to do the testing? Because uh, the, the best testing is that what, what the surgeon sees. In a point, yes, and in a point, no. Because, uh, well, I'm quite sure that all of our testing it will not uh, detect all of the coagulation problems. The coagulation system is much more complex than we have actually understood so far. So we uh, put many spotlights on uh, the coagulation system and try to detect whatever is wrong. And then uh, we give coagulation factors. So the good thing about this uh, testing is that you can um, target and uh, use your resources, which are usually blood products in a, a good way. But after all, it is like that, that sometimes you cannot detect anything and you have uh, a diffuse bleeding. So then it is part, I must say, a little bit of an experimental phase. If you start giving thrombocyte concentrates, fresh frozen plasma and coagulation factors. Also, if you go into the experimental setting in the end and you give everything, the bleeding doesn't stop sometimes. Okay. I think your uh, TEG machine is broken as well, Professor Zimmerman. I'm constantly telling my anaesthetist that it's bleeding and it's their fault. We have some more um, questions on the chat, I think. Uh, uh, any place for intra intraortic balloon control under LA? It is Phil Gibu uh, question from on the in the Q and A. I think um, this is something what uh, might actually be life saving for the patient. If we are in the patient with the patient in a resuscitating room, and uh, during our anesthesia workup, you have seen there's not much we have to do putting in these lines without general anesthesia. It'll take us about 10 minutes. Uh, the radial artery usually is the most difficult part of it, but if that uh, works after 10 minutes, we are done. Um, but if the patient comes in hypovolemic shock, we have uh, inserted under local anesthesia the uh, intraortic balloon in actually very short time. So that stabilizes the blood pressure of the patient quite a lot. And uh, after that induction of general anesthesia will, uh, will uh, give a good blood flow to the vital organs and the patient might survive that initial hit. Mm -hmm. And it is possible. Uh, and from Jason Lawson, if the decision has been made to go with uh, analgesic sedation, and then the indication to convert to general anesthesia intraoperatively, are there any specific considerations that have to be made or potential consequences from that? And he also says, thank you for a great presentation. Yeah. We have uh, with our concert of analgesic sedation, all the lines and tubes, except for the, um, for the endotracheal tube already in the patient. So, Think about the balloon to stabilize hemodynamics and um, we have to pre-fill the patient for in, uh, inducing general anesthesia. And then it is actually as if you would do it in a normal case. Mm. But sometimes if you don't have time and the patient gets hemodynamically unstable, loses consciousness, you have to go towards uh, general anesthesia and uh, hemodynamic compromise starts, then there's, this is what happens. And I think there's two, there are two related questions here, if we've got time, for Zoran, who's, who's pressing you. When do no. you add okay. FFP and coagulation factors? And uh, Lorenz Mealy, if the patient gets hemodynamically unstable, when do you transfuse the red blood cells? Do you have, uh, do you have, uh, different protocols for, for hemodynamic un instability, or is, is, it, is it always as simple as you showed us in that beautiful anesthetic chart? Well, we use actually a very simple concept. So all blood products 
are transfused uh, when the rupture is sealed. If you are at very, really low uh, hemoglobin levels, we use at the lowest level, we use uh, 70 grams per liter. So if you're below that little, we start actually uh, with uh, crystalloids, but if you're at really low levels, maybe um, 40, uh, 50 grams per liter, then you will have to infuse a little bit of uh, red blood cells. But also then we try not to go over 70 grams per liter because all what we give is going out of the rupture into the retroperitoneal space or intraperitoneal and will, um, and will um, result in the end in abdominal compartment syndrome. So that is what I mean, we do not over resuscitate the patient. Well, and I think we have another question. Uh, in and this is the last one? Last one, okay. Uh, it's not identified uh, uh, from whom is coming, but in case of aneurysm needing subclavian or extensive aortic coverage, do you use neuromonitoring or any experience in this regard as a guide of revascularization of subclavian artery? Maybe I will try yeah. to answer. This is too difficult. It's uh, very difficult. Yeah. It does so not belong. Do monitoring during the ruptures, don't you, Bernard? You have to repeat that, please. Do you use any neuromonitoring when you're doing rupture cases, even if are thoracic or thoracoabdominal cases? In our local anesthesia, the patient is their own neuromonitoring yeah. state. So even if you have a patient where you're going towards uh, repairing a thoracic uh, problem, you have an immediate, you can see the effect immediately. You can uh, raise the blood pressure. You can give, uh, you can, uh, give blood products. So uh, this is the best monitoring option in uh, for these patients. All well, other monitoring will only actually show that there might be a problem, but uh, the awake patient is the best. Thank you, Bernard. Let's move on. We have three more lectures and we are slowly out of time. Abdominal compartment syndrome, when to expect and how to treat. Pre-recorded presentation from Rui Fernandez and Fernandez, please. Good afternoon. My name is Rui Fernandez and I will be talking about abdominal compartment syndrome, when to expect and how to treat have no disclosures, and I will address uh, some uh, major definitions about this topic, abdominal compartment syndrome risk factors and detention, and ACS treatment. Background and definitions. There has been an increasing recognition of abdominal compartment syndrome as a complication of ruptured AAA treatment, and it's nowadays considered a leading cause of mortality both in open repair and EVAR. Protocolized monitoring and management of abdominal compartment syndrome is recommended in all patients treated for ruptured AAA, as the guidelines of the World Society of Abdominal Compartment Syndrome state, as both and the SVS guidelines for aneurysms. What is the intra-abdominal pressure? Intra-abdominal pressure is a steady state pressure concealed within the abdominal cavity. It decreases and decreases with respiration and is directly affected by solid organ or hollow visceral volume, space occupying lesions, especially blood, and conditions that limit the expansion of the abdominal wall, like third space edema. Intra-abdominal hypertension is defined by a sustained or repeated pathological elevation in the intra-abdominal pressure higher than 12 millimeters of mercury. This definition has varied through over the years, and thresholds as high as 40 millimeters of uh, mercury were being previously advocated. And even nowadays, most clinical clinicians only are really concerned when the intra-abdominal pressure is higher than 20. But the increase in intra-abdominal pressure leads to cardiac output reduction, respiratory insufficiency, conscious depression, renal clearance reduction, bacterial translocation and sepsis, impaired wound healing and facial dehiscence. And these pathological changes occur at very low levels of intra-abdominal pressure, as low as 10 millimeters of mercury. 
So abdominal compartment syndrome is defined as a sustained intra-abdominal pressure higher than 20 millimeters of mercury that is associated with new organ dysfunction or failure. And the most common organ dysfunctions are metabolic acidosis and hypertension, respiratory insufficiency, and acute kidney injury. So ACS triggers a vicious cycle that uh, initiates with fluid resuscitation for critical illness that leads to total body fluid to third spacing and edema and uh, elevated into abdominal pressure due to bowel edema, vena cava compression, reduced blood flow to the heart, reduced cardiac output, reduced blood flow to organs and multi-system organ dysfunction and failure. So intra-abdominal hypertension detection and ACS risk factors. To detect intra-abdominal hypertension, it's crucial to measure the intra-abdominal pressure. And in the mass cause, we have uh, uh, advocated the use of the follow manometer device that allows easy and repeated measurements of the intra-abdominal pressure. This device can even be used in the normal ward. In our center, we uh, established a protocol for intra-abdominal pressure monitoring through the years, and we could see that as our ability to detect intra-abdominal hypertension and SAS improved, our um, mortality rate was positively impacted. And in our experience, patients with uh, overt abdominal compartment syndrome have with significantly higher mortality rates than patients with either normal intra-abdominal pressure or uh, mild elevations of the abdominal pressure. Several risk factors have been identified for ACS and specifically for patients with ruptured triple A's, um, deep shock, transfusion, massive transfusion and fluid infusion, hypothermia, acidosis, and anemia have been identified and clearly uh, predict the risk for ACS. So how should we manage abdominal compartment syndrome? It used to be no recognition of intra-abdominal hypertension, so patients would only be diagnosed when they presented with overt ACS um, syndrome, abdominal compartment syndrome, and those patients would normally require the compressive laparotomy that some that many, many times wouldn't be effective. Nowadays, current intra-abdominal hypertension management includes prevention and a, a monitorization, so um, early levels of hypertension can be identified, techniques to lower the intra-abdominal pressure can be used, and we can improve targeted organ support. And so we can reduce the number of patients that develop ACS, and in this, this subgroup of patients, the compressive laparotomy still is uh, an end result treatment. Medical, treatment. medical treatment options include improving abdominal wall compliance, evacuate intraluminal and abdominal contents, correct positive fluid balance, and improve organ support. And this medical management is detailed in the guidelines of the World Society of Abdominal Compartment Syndrome. When surgical treatment is needed, um, the main, the first objective is to decompress the abdomen, and techniques like the Bogota bag or the Bogota vac can be used and allowed to decompress and lower the pressure inside the abdomen. When the risk for bowel ischemia is, is uh, considered low, then different techniques should be used to promote early closure of the fascia and complete abdomen closure. Here are example of the examples of the Bogota vac and the, the and the Bogota bag, and here an example of the mesh vac technique that can improve the uh, fascia closure and complete closure of the abdomen. But to crucially, the, the crucial uh, element to deal with uh, abdominal compartment syndrome is to establish management protocols. And here I'll show you, I'll show you an example of the protocol of Uppsala, where continuous pressure measurements are taken and medical treatment is early uh, initiated to reduce intra-abdominal pressure. And when it fails, then abdominal decompression is considered. 
In our center, we also have a decision algorithm in open surgery to decide either to leave the patient with a prophylactic open abdomen or not, depending on the risk factors, uh, both pre-operative and during the surgery for developing of ACS. Concluding, abdominal compartment syndrome is frequent after a rapid AAA treatment and carries a high mortality risk despite secondary decompression. Repeated intra-abdominal pressure measurements should be taken in every patient to increase early intra-abdominal hypertension recognition and initiate medical treatment, and standardized protocols for intra-abdominal pressure measurement and intra-abdominal hypertension treatment should be implemented in all institutions that treat ruptured AAA. If open abdomen is required, strategies to promote fascia closure should be considered. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was excellent. Absolutely excellent. The, the, the problem that we have is, is, is um, the same as I got asked just earlier, is teaching and training. And when we can't have a group of, of intensive care physicians that are, are really on the ball each time and trying to get them all to um, institute this medical management early enough to make a difference. Uh, is um, is difficult. We often get called when there's respiratory difficulties or when the patient is cardiovascularly collapsing. Is your uh, how have you managed to do this in your centre? Oh, you're on mute. You're muted. Sorry about this. I didn't have the sound uh, connected. Uh, thank you for your question. Well, I think uh, for us it was a process. Uh, initially, the, um, the intensivist care doctors wouldn't recognize it or wouldn't uh, establish protocols to measure pressure because if you don't measure intra-abdominal pressure, then you really can't tell if the patient is having a, a, a abdominal compartment syndrome or not. But uh, with time, we could uh, implement protocols to start measuring it, and then it's a natural process because people start to understand and see the correlation between the elevation of the pressure in the abdomen and the, the development of organ dysfunction. So then medical treatment, of course, is essential. And if you have uh, really motivated intensivists, you can... Uh, really improve your results with uh, abdominal hypertension. And nowadays we rarely perform a secondary pro uh, open abdomen treatment because medical treatment can take care of most of the, of the cases. Uh, it, it happens sometimes after, for example, an EVAR in a ruptured case that uh, the patient is not well even in the room and has a very high uh, abdominal pressure. And in these cases, we do immediately decompress the abdomen after EVAR. But uh, the, I think through time, our tendency was to open less and less abdomens because medical treatment is improving a lot. And I think this is very important. Uh, there's lots of uh, comments and questions in order. Uh, spot on. <laughs> Great talk. Very informative. Lots of thank yous. Um, there's, uh, so one from Phil Gibu here. What would be the current threshold for intra-abdominal pressure to initiate medical and surgical response? 10 or 25? 10, definitely 10. Uh, you should try, uh, start medical treatment uh, as soon as 10, 15 is uh, as high. Uh, again, you have a lot of protocols published that you can use and follow, or you can build your own protocol. It's very important to uh, take, on, take the intensivists on board because they will be treating the patient. So they must be on board and agree with your protocol. But uh, most of the protocols start fairly early at 10, 12, 15. The medical treatment. Surgical treatment is reserved only when you cannot lower the pressure with medical treatment and you have significant organ dysfunction. That's that's our, our politics nowadays regarding this. 
education and awareness of the concept of intra-abdominal hypertension is the first step, says Christos Karkos. Mm -hmm. And I think that is entirely reasonable. It's almost worth saying you should do the half the medical management before you even measure the intra-abdominal pressure. Anonymous attendee, welcome Anonymous, says, respected sir, after decompressive laparotomy, bogota bag closure versus VAC, is there any preference or evidence of one or better than the other? And I will add to that. And how do you put the back VAC on if you are going to use the VAC? So um, I don't know any evidence that is published and shows clearly what is the best option. For us, we prefer the Bogota VAC that we, uh, I showed it in one slide, where you basically do a Bogota, but you just use a ream of the, of the VAC to, to keep especially the patient dry and, and avoid all the, pro the problems that the Bogota bag normally uh, comes with, with uh, ex exudating and uh, uh, fluids through the, the, the abdomen. And it's really difficult to, to, to manage a patient in the ICU. So we just use a VAC, a very low pressure, just to keep everything uh, uh, clean and dry, and we can uh, we try to keep the the bowel uh, visible so you can look at it. It's not always easy, but we try to do that. I like the so, answer of both. Yes, a little bit of both. Yes. <laughs> Keeping your intensive care nurses on board uh, and you asleep is very important. Yes. The patient should not leave the operating table before an intra-abdominal pressure measurement. Yes, that's what we, we do in every case. That's what we do. Uh, There's a lot of love for that. Sorry, sorry. So, no, it's fine. I like the discussion. This is the advantage of uh, hands-on uh, Mart's course because we can had uh, long discussions. But now we continue. Thank you, Rui, for your excellent talk. And then we continue to next talk. Uh, does volume outcome play a role in rupture aortic aneurysm? It's going to be given by Matthias Trenner. He is from Munich Aortic Center, Technik University München, and Klinik Rechts der Isar. So it's great to be with us. So let's hear the pre-recorded presentation. Dear Chairman, dear audience, many thanks for the invitation to present at this extraordinary meeting. I'm going to try to answer the question if annual hospital volume has an effect on outcomes after ruptured AAA treatment. These are my disclosures. To answer the post question, I'm going to focus on two aspects. A, do high volume hospitals have better outcomes in ruptured AAA treatment? And B, is it safe to transport a patient with ruptured AAA to a center? I'm first going to focus on question A. This Vascunet analysis of the years 2010 to 2016 included 11 countries. It was published in circulation in 2019. They could show a clear volume outcome relationship for open repair of ruptured AAA and no effect for EVA. The overall EVA rate for ruptured AAA, however, only was 28%, and no data is given regarding EVA rates in low versus high volume hospitals. Looking at German data, EVA rates for ruptured AAA for men and women are steeply increasing and had almost reached 50% in the year 2016. Furthermore, an older analysis of German data showed that EVA rates for ruptured AAA are highly dependent on total AAA case volume of a center. EVA rate is low in low volume hospitals and high in high volume centers. In this recent analysis, we looked at 6,500 cases with ruptured AAA treated in the years 2010 to 2016. The overall raw mortality rate for ruptured AAA was 51.3% in hospitals treating less than 10 total AAA cases per year, while it was 27.8% in hospitals treating more than 75 AAA cases per year. 
This effect remained in the risk-adjusted analysis. As per current treatment guidelines, we choose 30 cases per year as reference. On the left-hand side of the dotted line, you see the odds ratios for hospitals treating less than 30 cases, which are all statistically significantly higher than uh, compared to the reference. On the right-hand side of the dotted line, you see the odds, odds ratios for hospitals treating more than 30 cases. They are all significantly lower than the reference uh, odds ratio. This leads to the question if 30 cases per year is really the, the optimal treatment threshold for AAA. However, this cannot go without question B, which I'm coming to next. Is it safe to transport a patient with rupture AAA to a center? How far can the center be away? And how big does the center really have to be? This meta-analysis from 2005 included five studies. They looked at mortality for transferred patients with rupture AAA, including those who died on transfer, versus outcomes for patients who directly presented at high-volume hospitals. In these studies and in the concurrent meta-analysis, no significant difference in mortality was seen, leading to the conclusion that transfer of patients with ruptures seems to be safe. A more recent analysis from the United States, however, saw a higher risk for patients, uh, for patients who were transferred um, if those who died on, on transfer were included. The EVA rate for the transferred patients was higher and of operative mortality for the, really, uh, for the patients who really received repair was lower, which leads to a reduced risk uh, uh, to reduce risk of mortality for the transferred and treated patients. So the conclusion of this conclusion of this study has to be that transfer has to be improved and also that um, transfers and centralization of rupture AAA care is highly dependent on the regional situation regarding ambulances, helicopter service, roadways, etc. I'm coming back to our own German data. We wanted to know about the travel burden that patients would have to face in a scenario of centralization. Therefore, we calculated the distance of the residency of the whole population to hospitals fulfilling uh, several minimum quantities. The green line represents the actual state. The orange line represents a minimum quantity of 30. This means in the German setting, um, with a minimum quantity of 30 cases, 53% of patients or of the whole population would have to travel less than 50 kilometers to the closest hospital. 85% of the population would be able to reach a hospital within 100 kilometers, and almost everyone would reach a hospital within 150 kilometers. This di distance seems to be acceptable to travel for elective patients, but also safe enough for emergencies, especially as Germany has quite a good helicopter service. Higher minimum quantities would possibly lead to a greater risk reduction, but don't seem safe anymore in the setting of rupture AAA. So the answer for question B really has to be, it depends on the regional setting, but also on the stability of the patient and on the uh, transport networks. I want to conclude. High volume hospitals surely have better outcomes in rupture AAA repair as the mortality is lower. Not only the routine uh, seems to play a role, but also the higher EVA rates. Transport and centralization of ruptures are highly dependent on regional structures, but if done well, it is likely to reduce mortality. Clear structures have to be implemented and small hospitals have to know who to call for a quick and smooth service. Many thanks for the attention and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Matthias, uh, for your session. And now we open up the Q&A, Jens. So I can start and read out uh, one of the questions uh, posed from uh, Isabel van Hersel. 
Um, is an SOP for Rupture AAA known to all members not more important than volume of uh, the hospital? Um, I surely agree that an SOP for Rupture AAA is very important, but um, it is usually the huge hospitals that implement SOPs and uh, that, that really work after SOPs. The same goes for EVA. Uh, as I said, EVA rates are higher in, in high volume centers and low in low volume centers. And uh, it's just the routine of the high volume centers that, is, that, is, that makes the outcome of, uh, for the patient. And if you look at, uh, if you look at the, uh, the panel, uh, I'm sure that all the people who, are, who talk about ruptures uh, work at a high, high volume center and they are expert and they, and they produce good outcomes. So um, yes, SOP is important, but it's uh, usually the team that is, that is playing with the SOP. Do you have uh, specific transfer protocols from remote centers? It is asked by Tahir Khan. Welcome, Tahir. Um, unfortunately, um, we don't have specific transfer protocols in Germany because we uh, work in a decentralized system. I don't know. Do, do you have any specific transfer protocols, Colin, in, in the UK? Yeah, we're still arguing about where all the centralization needs to go and. Uh, and uh, we it, we would normally have uh, th there certainly is nothing that has been agreed on a countrywide basis. I mean, we would literally tell them to stick them in an ambulance and um, get them there as quickly as possible. That seems a very good transfer protocol to start off with. Uh, and then any other advice that comes with it and then it is that comes with it is very useful, but uh, it's very difficult. And it, it depends on the center that it's coming from and how long it's coming from how long it will take to get there and which transport is being used in all these different things, isn't it? I think we have uh, two questions. Maybe we can look at this from Claudia Shrimp. Matthias, would you recommend a patient with a rupture to be transferred to a high volume center, even if there is a low volume center nearby? Um. Well, as I said in my talk, it, it really depends on the on the structure uh, on the local structures and on, on the pathways mm -hmm. and how far the, the 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 low volume center is away and how uh, how far the high volume center is away. If the patient is stable enough, of course, he should be transferred to the um, to the high volume center. And um, also, there are lots of people who say if a patient can't stand a transport, uh, he won't survive anyway. So um, they. They, they should all be transferred to a high volume center where they can get the best treatment. Uh, and this is uh, kind of the selection of the patient. However, um, it, it's, it really depends on, um, but usually um, the patient who is transferred to the, uh, to the uh, center that gives him the best treatment is the best possible outcome for the patient. And um, there is another question um, regarding, or, or Christos Karkos commented that transfer of CTA images electronically um, saves time and saves lives. Uh, and I absolutely agree if, if there is uh, good ways to transfer uh, CTA images and the centers can already prepare for the patient and they can already um, measure the, the CTA, um, it, give, it, it saves time and it helps to save life, absolutely. Thank you for the comment. What um, uh, do you think that it, things have changed over time, Matthias? You've done a lot of studying these uh, large volume databases, but uh, EVA was a thing that only happened in Zurich and Ghent uh, a while ago, and then it spread to whatever, and then it finally came to St Mary's. It, it spreads around the country and people become more and more adept and use, for, use at it. it. Is this going to change if, if everyone can do an EVA on a rupture almost as effectively? Um, it's, it's not only, it's not only the uh, performing the EVA, but as we, uh, as we heard before, it's about measuring the intra-abdominal pressure. It's about uh, anesthesiology management and all that. And all that can only be done by people who do it frequently. Fair enough. Because putting an EVA in is quite easy, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes. Uh, there is one comment here. Long transfer means selection of the fittest, more stable for intervention, giving apparent good results after a long transfer by uh, Dr. Abu Own. I think that's worth having a quick think about, isn't it? I, I, the, the, all of the results that you find in these things are slightly biased towards that comment. Um, well, they, they are slightly biased, but uh, there's no other way to find out about it, to be honest. So, um, I mean, um, you can you can only study uh, with real world data. It's um, it's always the same problem. They represent the real world, so and that's what we want to know. But yes, there is a bias. But um, there, there are also lots of patients palliated in small hospitals that don't appear in our statistics. Um, that's another bias um, that is favoring high volume hospitals. So. Um, it is real world. It is real world data that is always biased by the real world. So we can continue with the questions and answer. Thank you very much, Matthias, for a great talk, great discussion to all. But we have to move. So we are going to the next talk: the role of endolix after endovascular treated ruptured aortic aneurysm. And I'm happy to introduce Marco Treitel, Professor of Radiology and Head of Radiology de Department in Murnau International Radiology, Sebir, and everything. So please, let's hear the pre-recorded presentation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Welcome to the last presentation for today. My lecture will deal with the role of endoleaks after endovascular treated rupture aortic aneurysm. And I'd like to thank the course organizers for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. So what is the role of endoleaks after reverb? Is there a role that's different to so standard endovascular repair? We will find out. So um, for the moment, we know from several observation studies that um, there's an improved efficacy of the endovascular repair of rupture aneurysm in comparison to open surgical repair, but we still, well, we also know that the outcomes of EVAR elective and ruptured EVAR and open surgical repair still differ, and therefore we do not know whether the incidence, the behavior, the outcomes of endolix after REVAR would be different to standard endovascular repair. If you look at the literature, we see that there are only three publications uh, really delivering data about the incidence and uh, the outcome of analytics after the ruptured endovascular repair. We have a small series from Vela from 2013 dealing with 61 reverse. Quinn reported 166 reverse in 2017 and Olivier Pinto reported 65. Um, out of 565 in 2019. First of all, the uh, pr um, um, report of Velas and Oliviero Pinto is very similar regarding the incidence of type 1 and type 2 endoleaks. They did not see differences in contrast to standard endovascular repair and also no difference in contrast to historical data. The real difference in the incidence of endoleaks was only reported by Quinn. They saw um, and pretty much lower and significantly lower incidence of type 2 endoleaks with 9% for REVAR in comparison to elective endovascular repair, where they still had about 20% of endoleaks. Still same incidence for type 1 endoleak. But they also state in their publication that the low incidence of type 2 may be biased by a lower surveillance rate for the ruptured endovascular repair. So what could be a reason um, um, that we see a lower incidence of type 2 endoleaks after ruptured endovascular repair. First of all, maybe you won't administer a full anticoagulation regimen, regimen for your REVA patients during the procedure that could lead to an early spontaneous thrombosis of the lumbar arteries. Then we see a massive trauma to the vasculature at the site of the aneurysm rupture, and therefore this could release clotting factors that additionally lead to an early thrombosis of side branches. Then the big hematoma and the retroperitoneum again could um, address the early thrombosis or promote the early thrombosis of lumbar arteries, of course, again leading to a lower incidence of type 2 annual leaks. Of course, we have a higher mortality rate overall for the ruptured cases. Therefore, maybe they do not develop endo leaks because they simply die, of course. And of course, we know, especially from Quinn, that uh, type 2 annual leak in their series led to a higher 
rate of stancraft exploitation. All of these could lead indeed to a lower incidence. However, in the majority of publications, we do not see any differences. So should we treat them? Hmm. And the leaks after Reva will still deteriorate the outcome similar to standard EVO. We will see insufficient sealing, we see ongoing bleeding, ZAC growth. We do not know the stability of the aneurysm sac after rupture. We have an unknown risk of re-rupture or the loss of, loss of Stancroft sealing. And therefore, from my point of view, I do not see a difference. If you see an endoleak after rebar, I will treat it similar to e EVA. And of course, we will do for type one cuff stenting, extensioning, endo anchoring, transatrial embolization, and for the type twos, since this is a lesion uh, that is comparable to AVM, that means it's a sudden and shortage inside the blood circuit containing nidus, feeders, and draining arteries, um, we will have to address all three components to really be sure that the um, lesion and the analyte will not come back and we have a complete ceiling. So the treatment strategies are all, well, are all very well known for the type twos we see and feeding over the inferior mesenteric artery, we could address this transatelial route over the rear run anastomosis, or we will see and feeding over the hypogastric and the iliolumbar artery, retrograde flow inside the lumbar arteries that could be addressed by direct puncture or by a transatelial route as well. But I think after a ruptured EVA, we can expect some differences in the anatomy and the addressability of the vessels. And therefore, I think for ruptured cases with recurring endoleak, there's a higher uh, indication for translumbar direct puncture and perigraft embolization than for standard cases, because it would be easier and you always get direct access to the nidus. And this is essential because you do not want to have several redo procedures. And then we only talk about transatrial and transcarbal puncture after having um, use the other two options to treat them. So just an example on how we should address uh, complex cases that maybe develop both type one and type two endoleaks. This is a case of an 87 years old, not having ruptured aneurysm repair, but an iliac side branch and a standard aneurysm. And she developed a type one B with insufficient sealing in the hypogastric artery and also in type two failed by the lumbar arteries and the IMA. So this is a very nice case where we can use a direct puncture. You see already in the CT scan, the catheter in the hypogastric artery aneurysm, and now we switch routinely into the endogram, endosuit, sorry. You see the endoleakography, the injection of contrast into the endoleak. You see nicely the aneurysm sac of the hypogastric, the outflows. And now we were able to steer into the outflow vessels, occlude them with coils. Then we went upwards to the aneurysm sac of the aorta, that new, another endolecography, we nicely saw all the outflows, the hypogastric, uh, the IMA, sorry, and the lumbar arteries, and we could address each of them, do a plug embolization or coil embolization, and at the end, after having occluded all draining vessels, we filled up the aneurysm nidus in their order and also in the hypogastric aneurysm with onyx. This was not so much volume onyx required, so at the end, after feeding, filling the nidus, this is the final result. The whole analytic was solved and there is, of course, no, no possibility of a recurrence. So I really um, apply that, um, suggest that the treatment of draining and inflow vessels and nidus in combination should solve the problem. And once again, I think there's no difference for the ruptured endovascular endolytic cases. We should then treat them in a similar way. Thank you very much. I'm now here to answer your questions. Um, have a nice evening and take care. Thank you very much. <clears throat> very good. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Uh, uh, Clark Zebras. Theoretically, all patients with any endoleak after ruptured aneurysm should die because of bleeding, but they don't. <laughs> How come? Very beautifully put. Well, I think if you have an, an, an ongoing bleeding in the, in the early phase of the endovascular repair, maybe it's not called endoleak, it's called an ongoing bleeding, and therefore we have to uh, address them differently, right? I think we talk about endoleaks in the in the follow up after a few weeks or months, and then, of course, the the rupture side should be sealed, and therefore we really have a clear endoleak, and that's the difference. But Marcus, I, I mean, there's a hole in the aortic wall, uh, so theoretically, 
uh, it should go on and they, they, they should lose blood for, for hours or days, but they don't. Is this because of a contained rupture or because of the thrombus seals or, or what? Well, I don't know. I have a clear explanation. explanation. Um, to be honest, maybe it's uh, caused by several factors like the pressure, like the thrombus formation, whatsoever. For the moment, I do not have an exact explanation. Sorry for that. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Christos Karkos. Endolite type 2 in the immediate post-operative period after ruptured aneurysms. Management, he suggests, sit tight, correct aggressively the clotting abnormalities, transfusers retire, re required, and then monitor closely for uh, intra-abdominal hypertension, ab abdominal compartment syndrome. Uh, in the rare cases, open up and patch the defect. Um, what do you think of, uh, <laughs> he's asking for Zoran's support in this, but we'll, we'll just ask you, Marcus, what you think. <laughs> Uh, if I uh, want to answer, sometimes end leak tip uh, two from the lumbar arteries or in case when we make a coiling of internal iliac artery and extending the stent graft in external iliac artery still continue with uh, bleeding to the rupture site. And um, that's why we are doing sometimes CT angio. We are doing always CT angio post -op, immediate post-operatively. And what is also in cases, then we don't want to convert the EVAR to open surgery. We take sometimes the xenopericar patch and we suture the uh, rupture side. This is something like the damage uh, control in this situation. This is, I think, what uh, Christos uh, was asking. So why don't you want to open up the graph, open up the aneurysm and then sew off those lumbers at the back? Because no. you get so much porosity in the graft after a rupture. I think in that situation, the, the less is more effective. So that means opening the graft maybe can result on dislocation of the graft or made. Also, we have the hematological bleeding impairment. So we want to make it uh, as uh, fast as possible. Sometimes we have a balloon and we inflate this balloon through the groin, including the limb. And then we have a um, good field to suture this uh, patch. Mm. So, so, Marcus, um, I also have a, a question because I think um, you probably have a really huge experience with um, onyx embolization of type 2 endoleaks. And I think uh, to make this um, onyx embolization of a type 2 endoleak um, directly after an aneurysm will probably stop that what uh, Clark assumed that continuing bleeding, even if, if we see that very, very little. But what I really want to know is, as we all know, that the Nelix prosthesis failed due to the instability of the thrombus. If you put in your onyx or your coils, this is also a very stable product in a very fragile thrombus. How can you say something about the long-term results of, of these um, endovascular treatments of these type 2 endoleaks? Uh, so far, I didn't see any uh, late failures of the onyx itself. It really depends on the technique you're applying to seal the endoleak. And I think the biggest problem why we still have the discussion on endoleak treatment or not is that there are so many different treatment approaches that have been applied, how to address this lesion. Um, I think the best way still is to, uh, to really um, search for any feeding and draining vessel, do an embolization of the vessels, and then fill up the nidus with the onyx. The onyx cast itself would be stable, for, of course. Um, however, I think it's it's difficult to co compare the nelix principle with the simple onyx embolization of a small part of the aneurysm sac. Um, you do not apply that a comparable pressure to the thrombus and to the uh, whole structure. Um, if you do just an onyx injection into a small part of ending in, in contrast to the Nelix processes. So, so far, if, if, it's, if the primary procedure is successful and you are able to um, seal the annual leak with, an, with a combination of uh, inflow, outflow, embolization, and onyx for the nidus, I so far I didn't see over the 10 years of experience any late degradation of the cast or any, uh, let's say, erosion of the thrombus. So I really think the comparison to the Nelix 
um, is a little bit too, uh, too difficult. I think the principles are still a little bit uh, different from my point of view. Okay. So thank you very much. Um, I, I think we should move on. Uh, yes. Okay. We have, uh, maybe you can say who is the sponsor of this uh, sponsor symposium. And I will introduce the guys who are going to talk about this. So, okay. Yeah. Um, the, the next is uh, also going to be on um, rupture cases. But uh, now we, we talk about endovascular again, like we did um, yesterday. So thank you for the great faculty talking about uh, perioperative management. The next two talks will be sponsored by Medtronic. Thank you for that. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, first, first of all, I want to congratulate the organization for this wonderful workshop and thank them for the invitation as well as Medtronic. As you know, we live in an endovascular world, but uh, we have to face with more and more complex AAA. And as published many years ago by Chancer, about half of the cases were treated outside of the IFU and the main reason was hostile necks. So how can we manage these hostile necks and complex uh, AAA? Uh, if we look to the literature, in 2019, the European Society published their guidelines and they told us that, that in case of juxtarenal AAA, complex endovascular repair should be considered. And what about the cases of rupture? They also say that in case of rupture, if the anatomy is suitable, endovascular repair is recommended. And in complex endovascular repair, there is a place for par parallel graft techniques such as chimneys or periscope, especially as an alternative in the emergency setting, so very well dedicated to rupture case. But what about the real life? We can see very optimistic, optimistic ones who published many years ago that almost every case can be treated by uh, adjunct techniques such as chimney in case of rupture AAA. Why? Probably because there are many advantages associated with Chivar in emergency. You can use off-the-shelf devices, you can really adapt to almost every anatomy. The cases can be quickly done in experienced team and it's always possible to stop the intervention before the stand graft deployment, especially if you cannot cannulate the target vessel. But you have to follow some rules to be sure that you can have good results. Normally maximum two chimneys and you have to plan an adequate oversizing with minimum 30%. You need an proximal approach normally from the left and there is no place for improvisation if you really have to secure your case using a standardized approach. It starts with a left axillary access in our team, but any possibilities uh, can be considered from the left or even from the right. We use this access be because it allows for a complete rotation of the C-arm around the patient to allow for a good visualization of the SMA or the celiac trunk when necess if necessary, especially if you need multiple chimneys and other adjuncts, you can create a conduit with this artery to put your sheets. It also requires an inverse position in the aura when you do chimney, you have to work from the left, so you have to position all your environment dedicated to this new position, especially when you work from the left axillary access uh, to have a good visualization of your screens. As a sheet, we generally use a talkable one as the OSCAR because it really helps you a lot to cannulate the target vessel, especially if there is kinking or very big ambulation. So I will present you some cases more and more tricky of rupture AAA that we have treated with Chival. The first case was a man, 71 year old with a renal disease stage three, who was known for a AAA of seven centimeters, but he denied any treatment. Finally, he came to the emergency unit with a rupture juxtarenal aneurysm and the CT scan shows also a left atrophic kidney. 
So we discussed a lot with him and finally it was discussed to go for a chivar with chimneys in the right renal artery and the SMA. Here you can see the angiocity with this rupture on the left side of the patient and the patent right renal artery and an atrophic left kidney. So we went to the or and started with a cannulation of the SMA and then we do an arthrography where you can see the celiac trunk and the SMA and the right renal artery which were already cannulated. We mark the level of the CT with the devices already in place especially both sheets and both chimneys but not deployed. We deployed then all the material and you can see here the final NGO with a small leak on the right side of the stent graft. It was due to a right renal stent that was a little bit too short and when we do a selective uh, and, uh, angiography in the renal stent you can see that there is this leak so we went for an additional renal stent that was placed uh, with a very good result. In the follow-up, there was no problem. Fortunately, the patient didn't require any dialysis and can went and, and could go back home. And at a follow-up of 18 months with control ultrasound, there was no leak, the chimneys were patent, and the patient was not under dialysis. In the second case, a woman with 80 years, years old came with severe cardiac disease, especially ischemic and valvular, valvular for abdominal pain. A CT scan was done showing a symptomatic juxta renal uh, AAA, a very big one of, eight centi uh, of 9 cm with very short ilax, especially on the left side. So we discussed and we opted for a chivar with a left IBD because there was no rupture, so we have uh, a little bit of time. You can see here the CT with a big aorta, no, no neck, and this very big aneurysm of 9 cm, very symptomatic, perhaps due to some instability in the thrombus here, but a small infiltration here, but no rupture and a very short iliac on the left, and it was not possible to go for a normal limb, so either embolize the hypogastric or the IBD. We started with the cannulation of both renals, and then we did an angio in the lateral view to see the SMA and mark it and then deploy the stand graft with the chimney not in place and then we deployed the chimney with a very nice result proximally. And then we went distally, place the IBD and cannulate the hypogastric from proximal and then place the internal stand to have a good ceiling and then you can see here the final result that was very good and you can see here on the CT of control that there was no leak, patency of both chimneys, of both limbs and also patency and sealing of the IBD with a good stent in the hypogastric and an excellent result. In the follow-up, there was no problem during the post-operative time with a duration of eight days, patient went home with dual antiplatelet therapy as normally every patient with chimneys and at six months she was still alive with no endolic. The third case was a man 95 years old with also renal disease stage 3, known for a in 2016 for a AAA of 7 cm, but then he was lost from follow-up. He came back to the emergency unit with abdominal pain and CT scan was done showing an endolic type 1A and 3 and a rupture aortic aneurysm. We discussed with the patient and finally decided to go for a GIVA. So you can see here the angio CT done preoperatively and you will see that there is this big type 1A endolic with the rupture. You can see here the endolic type 1A, there was some material of embolization and also here a type 3 endolic. So we went To the operation room and when we do the first angio we see a dissection of the left, left renal artery before any cannulation. Finally we cannulate it and placed a self-expanding stent to stabilize it and then we place our both sheets, mark the SMA 
and then deployed all the material with a good result. In this case, we used a proximal cuff. And you can see the final NGO with no under leak, a good patency of the stent graph, good patency of the right renal artery, but the left one was not visible, therefore we did a selective uh, angiography of the left renal artery that was patent. And the result was good because the patient didn't require any dialysis and could be extubated. Unfortunately, at 10 days, he developed a gastrointestinal bleeding and at this moment he denied any investigation or treatment and unfortunately died at day 12. The last case was a woman, 89 years old, also with renal disease stage 2. And in her history, she had been operating two times in 2016 with a Chivas with three, three chimneys, both renals and the SMA, and some months later with a TVAR for a type B aortic dissection. She was followed with contrast ultrasound, and no endolict was seen, and the aneurysmal sac was stable. But she came to the emergency unit with abdominal pain, a CT scan was done showing a ruptured triple A on a type 1A endolic with an occlusion of the right renal artery and the stent and a disconnection of the stent in the SMA. You will see here the angio CT with the TIVA that is in place and then the chimneys with the Nelix and this big endolic and the rupture with a big aneurysm. So you can see Here that in the oral there are two sheets, the end of the TIVA and then the right renal stand that was occluded, the left one patent and the disconnection here of the SMA stand and both Nelix. So the strategy was to go with an endurance 2S up to the TIVA in order to open the bifurcation proximal to both Nelix stands and do a sandwich technique with chimneys in the SMA and in, in, in the left renal artery with very long stent, distally VBX and then proximally viable and rein, reinforced with self-expanding stent. So we started with a cannulation of the SMA stent and then the SMA as well as in the left renal artery. And then we went with long chimney and with the endurant and you can see here that the proximal part of the endurant was we here with a good overlap with the TIVA and then proximal stents were here. So long chimneys, then we did a big ballooning to enter for a good ceiling and the final result with a nice result, no more leak, patency of both chimneys and patency of the Nelix. The post up was good, no problem, went back home at eight days, no dialysis and the dural antiplatelet therapy and the contrast ultrasound showed no endolic and the gymnase patent. So our experience at the SHUV in the last two and a half years, we uh, operated eight cases, six men with a mean age of 79 years old with a mean aortic diameter of 67 millimeters. The mean duration of intervention was 153 minutes and both renals were stented for chimneys in five cases and in three cases one renal and the SMA. We used normally balloon expandable stents, 10 B grafts, 5 VBX and 4 Adventa and the cases were done percutaneously in six cases, one death in the post-operative time, so we for a mortality rate of 13%. You can see here a nice result with chimneys in both renals with an endurant and prolonged on the right side with another IV. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, Chivar seems to be safe and effective for complex aortic aneurysm rupture. It allows especially to adapt to almost every anatomy and situation. And it is possible to combine this strategy with multiple other designs such as sandwich or IBD to really offer the best solution to our patients. But the technique must be well trained and standardized as there is no place to improvisation if you want to have very good results. And therefore, this is the reason why.
So thank you for your presentation, Sebastian. A very great, great talk about your experience with with uh, uh, Chiva. I think, in, especially in emergencies, this is a really very good uh, option to go for. And there are already um, questions from the audience. And uh, what was very impressive was uh, uh, was the picture with with the patient with the <laughs> arms over the head. And w one um, uh, question here from. Clark Siebrecht says, aren't you afraid for plexus lesions by overstretching both arms more than 90 degrees? Did you experience any neurological problems of that? Yeah, thank you very much first for the invitation and congrats again for this uh, nice uh, workshop and hello, Alexander and Lado and Zoran. Uh, and sorry for the for the sound that was not uh, perfect uh, at the end. Uh, yes, it's a, it's a special position. Uh, I learned this position uh, from... Uh, uh, the team from Regensburg, when they came once to, to help us for one of the first fenestrated cases that uh, we did in 2011. And uh, we placed uh, the patient in this position. And since that time, I continue to, to use this position. I, I really never experienced a plexus problem. Once I had a problem with, with the nerve, but probably it was due to the or to the preparation of the artery and a direct lesion of, of the nerve. But for sure, you have to be a really to take care of the patient and to not to put too much tension on the, uh, on the arms. And therefore we develop uh, uh, really uh, a, good, uh, a good cup that we can place uh, behind the arms to be sure that uh, there is no tension and we check this. And normally I personally check this uh, before starting the operation, especially for very old patients where you can have uh, some rigid uh, articulation and it's something that you have to to have in mind and uh, not to place uh, uh, every patient in the same position but one of the advantage of this position uh, especially if you work uh, with a C arm as uh, as we do uh, because for the moment we are waiting for a hybrid room is that uh, in case of uh, of uh, obese patient where you have to 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 see very well for example the the the, the SMA in the lateral view if you have the arm in the in the field, it's very difficult to see perfectly your, your arteries. So with this position, you really like clean your field, and uh, it's easier to to have a good visualization of the of the visceral arteries. Okay, yeah, in, 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 in impressive uh, position. I never did it like uh, that way, but um, yeah, it's it's really. So you have you have, you have special pillows or? or um... Yeah, we we place uh, we have uh, we have. Uh, uh, paint a, a pillow and it was been then uh, built by the by the hospital and we have two two of them uh, so that we can we can really use uh, uh, when necessary and it's really a, a big uh, pillow where the patient has some place for the uh, for the head in between and then place for the for two arms so uh, the the arms really relies uh, rely on the on the pillow so that there is no no tension they are not in the uh, in the suspended but really fixed to to the pillow another advantage of this uh, of this position uh, it's, it's that uh, the uh, there was a, a movie but finally i deleted it because there was some problem with the sound but you can really have a quick access to the axillary because it's not too deep and uh, the diameter is good and it's probably easier to have access to the axillary artery at this uh, site than on an infraclavicular incision. And the diameter is good, so you can place normally without any problem two sheets or two chimneys. So, uh, so really, I appreciate it, but really take care of the, of the position. Okay. And there are two questions uh, concerning um, the double antiplatelet therapy from Philip uh, Gibou and uh, Thomas Stadelbauer. Um, they ask, um, how long will you keep up with, with your double antiplatelet therapy? Or even if you give a double antiplatelet? Yeah, normally, well, normally we give dual antiplatelet, antiplatelet therapy, sorry, uh, when we do a chimneys or fever or, or beaver. Uh, for sure, in case of rupture, AAA, we wait to be sure that the patient is stable and there is no, no more bleeding, no endoleak. But after one or two days, if it's okay, we started with the, with the DRPT and normally for at least between six months to one year. Uh, at the beginning, I went for just three months, but then I, I saw some occlusion of the stents, especially in, in fever and Biva. And now for all these cases, I go for at least six months sometimes uh, till uh, one, one year. So interesting thing is, so we talked um, shortly about uh, that uh, 
problem in, 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 the, in the end is that there are no recommendations, no guideline, nothing as far as I know concerning anti-platelet therapy, anticoagulation um, during and after uh, complex endovascular aortic repair. Does anyone know about something? No. <laughs> so a lot of work to do. You're right. There is, there is nothing uh, in, the, in the literature about this. I think that uh, nowadays uh, when you speak in the, in the Congress, in the meetings, the majority of people go for at least six months for all fever, viva, and, and chimneys, but there is no clear recommendation. I think there is no big studies. So uh, uh, it's like uh, experience, but uh, after experience, some occlusion, and especially one day due to occlusion of the SMA and, and both renals, I know go for uh, at least six months for every patient. Okay. And when, when you, when you um, expand your self expandable uh, chimney grafts, you usually do that only for the chimneys or do you just some simultaneous ballooning of, of your uh, aortic stand graft as well? No, normally when I, when I do chimneys, I, I go with uh, um, balloon expandable stands. Uh, and then first I place the stand graft and then the suprarenal fixation. And then I open the chimneys. And at this moment, I balloon everything together. So ballooning in the, in the neck uh, and the stand graft and ballooning in both renals. Normally, I don't reinforce them with self-expanding stent. In the case with the with the sandwich, it was so long with the via band that so that I reinforce them. But normally, when it's just like standard chimneys, this balloon is Okay. Yeah. So um, there are no more questions um, from the audience, and uh, I think we are much over the time, and um, therefore. I would thank uh, you, Sebastian and uh, Flado, for being part uh, of uh, this uh, special lecture um, sponsored by Medtronic. I would like to thank the faculty. And I think now, in the end, it's um, up to uh, Benedict and uh, Soran. Uh, we three organized this course to say some words of farewell. So probably, Soran, you start. Yeah, we started also 10 years ago, so I will start now. So I think um, this, we started as a hands-on workshops and then uh, we had a lot of time, plenty of time to discuss this, to, to go in deep. Now we moved to online because of COVID time and this hybrid is uh, definitely something what uh, from my point of view and what we talked also is working also. That will never uh, compete the hands-on and direct discussion because the goal is to have faculty, 50 faculty, 50 participants and to discuss that in detail. So all these questions that they were not answered would be answered in that situation. Uh, furthermore, I'm so happy that there are so many faculty who were with us uh, all these years. And on the other side, there are so many new faculties in so good lecture so that uh, we really enjoyed. From my point, I will uh, just say that we had uh, 150 to 110 today. The last day we have 120 participants. And what can I say you? I, I would be very happy to widespread the March course and then hope to see you all. And I think always we learned a lot. We learned also from you. At least I learned a lot. And then I think also you had a chance to learn uh, from us. So that's from my point. And I'm, uh, finally, I'm going to say you like this, but now let's go to hear Benedict and uh, Alexander. Yeah, from my point of view, uh, also thank you very much to all particip participants and especially uh, to the audience. They, um, they made this uh, March course uh, very um, lively and uh, they uh, participate, uh, participated very well with a lot of uh, very interesting questions and um, 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 we're looking forward to plan the next March course. Uh, we'll I have a lot of ideas how to to uh, expand the this course uh, with uh, maybe um, an online part as well. So we're looking forward to next year and hope to see you all again. Bye.